This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. This weekend in Russia, tens of thousands of people marched. In fact, in Moscow alone, 60,000 people took to the streets. It was the largest single demonstration Russia has seen in years. We're joined right now by Nina Khrushcheva, professor of international affairs at the New School, co-author of In Putin's Footsteps, Searching for the Soul of an Empire Across Russia's Eleven Time Zones, also the author of The Lost Khrushchev, Journey into the Gulag of the Russian Mind. Um, <clears throat> professor Khrushchev, if you can talk about um, the significance of these mass protests at this time, and in part one, we talked about what's happening in the streets. How has Putin—has what Putin, how he has responded, surprised you in any way? It did, in a sense, that um, Putin is concerned about his legacy. One of the reasons he came back in 2012 as president is because he didn't think that uh, Russia was strong enough after he— kind of made it better uh, during very uh, disarrayed and chaotic years of Boris Yeltsin in the 90s. So he didn't feel that Russia was strong enough. I mean, he also has suffered from this typical Russian disease that presidents cannot—I mean, leaders cannot leave. They only die in office most of the time. Uh, but he wanted to make sure that that transition to the strong Russia is, um, is sustainable. And, in fact, as all autocrats, unfortunately, um, he shot himself in the foot because he stayed on for too long. Nobody buys the because one of the things that he did, for example, uh, during the protest that I was my last protest on the 27th of July, which was which probably had about 20 people in the streets. It was unsanctioned, so it was even braver of people to go on and protest. Uh, and there was very brutal uh, disbursement. There was, I think, over 1,000 people, almost 1,500 people were arrested at the time. Uh, so what did he do uh, in those days? He went and uh, dived in a sarcophag of some sort, uh, sort of to show that he is the man of all trades, sort of the jack of all trades, uh, the James Bond of contemporary Russia. Uh, what did he do last Saturday, which was yesterday? He went to Crimea, and he uh, drove with the bikers that are all in leather, half-naked, uh, kind of in the most ridiculous way possible, to once again show strength. And all these things, they outlived its significance. They really—I mean, he's essentially a laughingstock. And I think that's the scary part uh, for uh, Putin, which, on one hand, as I said, it doesn't surprise me, his response, because, you know, what do autocrats respond with? Respond with they respond with, uh, with force. On the other hand, he's concerned about his legacy. So if you're concerned about your legacy, you don't want to become Stalin. You really don't want to have a KGB running your operation. And well, I he think comes out of KGB. What comes out of KGB running, right, the FSB, the I mean, security. he comes out of— He comes out of KGB, but he was always sort of saying, well, I'm larger than that. I am a man of history. I understand why Peter the Great was great, and so on. So he—that's his legacy, and it's being really very much tarnished. But I think at this point, he reached the um, he reached the the level of power or level of um, kind of time of staying in power. That in fact, the legacy of his own safety is more important than the legacy of Russia, and that's how he undermines his his existence. So it didn't surprise me, but I wouldn't expect it to get any less because for them now, for the security forces, it's a personal fight. It's a fight of power that Russia has to be all the besieged fortress from outside and inside. And that's why they claim that it's the Western plot once again. Once again, nobody's buying it anymore. So I think it's a great predicament for him, because nobody buying that argument. And also, there's really no systemic way of dealing with what's happening in the streets right now. Everybody is trying to blame each other. Uh, Moscow mayor is now is guilty because he didn't uh, he let it get out of control. The security forces saying, we're going to help you and do it, and we basically suppress every single, uh, every sort of very 1984-ish, uh, we're going to suppress every single person who comes out to the street. But in the meantime, when they're uh, 
basically trying to fight it off without having a strategy of how to deal with it, there is much more separation going on between what the state wants and what the people want. And I don't think it's a really good recipe for Putin's continued time in office, and he officially has to be in office until 2024. Probably, if he can, he'd like to stay longer, because he can't leave in a normal way. Um, so I think Russia is very much uh, at the crossroads right now. Can you explain what happened to Alexei Navalny? and who he is, his imprisonment, then uh, his doctor claiming he was somehow poisoned? And that's an—I mean, Alexei Navalny, I probably don't need to explain your, your viewers, because he has been around for a long, long time. He has been arrested many times. He has been accused of uh, um, embezzling from some wood— shopping enterprises or from beauty, uh, beauty factory or some, I don't remember. There's all these absolutely ridiculous accusations. And so now uh, he has this um, channel, the YouTube channel, which is very popular, called Navalny Live. Uh, and they've been raided every time that they try to transmit the, uh, the protests. He's a, an opposition lawyer. He's put out numerous um, uh, documentaries that are very popular. Uh, he hasn't touched Putin. He has touched Putin many times, but he hasn't done documentaries on Putin, per se. He's one of the best-known documentaries was about Dmitry Medvedev. You probably don't remember who he was. Uh, I would like to remind everybody he was a, a kind of chair-warming president for Putin from 2008 to um, 2012. Uh, and uh, he seemed like, a, and at least Medvedev was perceived as a uh, less— uh, less corrupt, uh, less hardliner, much more modern, m modernizing force. I mean, he was so modernizing that he uh, squished Russian 11 time zones to nine time zones. So Russia is more than when Putin came back, he expanded again to 11 time zones, because size matters. So Navalny did this film uh, about the collection of um, uh, Medvedev's watches, and millions and millions watch it, and kind of got really angry about what the power has and does. Um, so he is an important opposition figure. He's called the systemic opposition, or non actually non-systemic opposition at this time. Uh, but um, he's not really a leader of the opposition, because, as I said, I think it's more of a dissident movement. He's the most important figure of it. Uh, he makes people, because he's so not afraid, uh, he makes people more courageous, but uh, not necessarily leading uh, with some specific offering. And what happened to him in jail? Uh, in jail, yes. So now he was arrested. He's been arrested all the time. Uh, and apparently he got uh, the story is that he may have got poisoning or he got some sort of a, um, allergic reaction to something. But with the poisoning stories that come out of Russia, probably likely. And I think it brings me to my earlier point about the uh, security forces. Um, I think they're really playing dirty at this point. And they actually feel justified, because the more people come to the street, the more, like in Hong Kong, the argument is that we're protecting the national sovereignty. We're protecting uh, Russia from uh, from disintegration. We're protecting Russia from uh, all these influences that really should not be uh, should not be uh, seen on the Russian soil. Um, so. The story, once again, is still out. We don't know exactly what happened to him. Uh, but uh, I worry about him more than I've ever done before, because before they always stopped short from—and I hate saying that— but from really doing much more harm to him than they have done, uh, that have done so far. But it is possible that they would say, well, he's an enemy, and therefore, as an enemy, uh, there is, you know, as a non—what non, uh, was it? Non-enemy combatant, he's going to be—he's uh, going to be liquidated. Perfect. Professor Khrushchev, I wanted to ask you about something that's been happening at the same time. Questions are mounting over last Thursday's explosion in the White Sea off the northern coast of Russia, which killed at least seven people, it's believed mostly nuclear scientists. The blast caused a radiation spike in the surrounding area, and U.S. experts are um, suspect it was caused during a test of a nuclear-powered cruise missile. This coming as concerns are growing over the renewed nuclear 
arms race between U.S. and Russia following President Trump's withdrawal from the landmark INF Treaty. That's the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. Earlier this month, Russia responded uh, by calling the INF Treaty formally dead. So what do you know of what's happened? There are a lot of people in the United States who are watching the TV series Chernobyl right now, so it's sort of bringing it back into the present, the horror of what took place then. What do you understand, and where is this place, and what is it? Well, I'm not a military expert, but by, by no means it is uh, on— um uh, on the White Sea, it's in, on the north of, of, of Russia. It's very close to Norway. It's very close to Sweden. It's very close to Scandinavia. Uh, and uh, um, it's also very close to the places where one of the original protests took place. I mean, the early protests took place about the garbage site. So, I mean, there's a, a big story. That's how protests, uh, protest movement began. So, in, interesting there that uh, somehow it became once again the center of everybody's attention, this place. Um, one of the reasons um, that everybody worries so much, because the information is very scarce, we don't know exactly what happened. Uh, we know that some people were um, some people were uh, were killed. They died in the explosion. Uh, there was also information on the city site that um, uh, that the radiation went up, and then suddenly that information disappeared. So, which th if something like that happens, you really know that there is a problem. So there is a problem, uh, and it is understood that probably uh, the thing that blew up is uh, that uh, when Putin was showing his cartoons last year in the State of the Nation address to kind of scare the United States um, uh, about the uh, nuclear missile carrier um, Burivesnik, which I think is called the— um, um, some sort of a bird. I don't know exactly the translation of it. Uh, and uh, it, 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 it is suspected that maybe when there was a test of this particular uh, particular apparatus, it, it did uh, it did blow up. And with the Chernobyl, of course, so fresh on everybody's mind, because in Russia, the spikes uh, on the book that it was based on, unfortunately, Hollywood decided not to uh, not to give credit to this wonderful writer, Svetlana Alexievich, who was based on her book, The Chernobyl Prayer. What do you mean they decided uh, not to they give just, credit? She was not credited in, in, in the, you know, because America is always very concerned about other people, intellectual rights, but uh, about its own intellectual rights, but not necessarily a woman who sits in Minsk. So it was anyway, based on her It was based, uh, I think, out of seven characters, five characters came out of her book. I mean, it's now being resolved, but originally it just shows you uh, that, um, you know, the United States also could be somewhat hypocritical in many ways. So, uh, and in, in, in Russia, the, the book purchases were spiked, I think, 10 times, uh, and everybody was reading that. So it's not only in the United States where this story is being watched and understood very much in this Chernobyl shadow, but it's also in Russia as well. And that kind of secrecy that we don't know what's happening. So on one hand, Putin brags to the West about that thing that they are developing. On the other hand, the test goes goes bad, and we know nothing nothing about what. What I learned last night is that apparently the um, the navigation stopped around that area. So if the navigation stops around that area, that suggests that that uh, amount of radiation that they posted and then took out actually is there. And so we just see how it develops. And I'm quite surprised that we haven't heard much from the Scandinavian countries yet, because they should be the one really beating the alarm very, very heavily. And then uh, just the significance of President Trump pulling out of the INF Treaty, what this means. Well, when I think when Putin was showing those cartoons, it was the response to uh, the Americans saying, we're going to pull out. And so Putin was saying, fine, you're going to pull out, we're going to develop develop those things, and, you know, you should be scared. I mean, I think the significance is is there just because Russia needs to be, um, um, as Reagan would so, say, trust, but verified. I wouldn't even trust. They would just verify all the time. But at the same time, the United States is also not a country nowadays that can be trusted as well and and uh, taken seriously. I think, I think we're in a perfect storm right now when Russia is incompetent, but also flexing its muscle more than ever before, and America is incompetent, uh, and flexing its power of superiority more than ever before. So I think the, significant is, the significance is there, and uh, it is really too bad that uh, neither side 
uh, even if they talk about these things, neither side can either be trusted or even be expected to be coherent in this kind of conversation. So this is one of those rare moments that you would somewhat miss Ronald Reagan uh, and Mikhail Gorbachev and, and their conversation in Reykjavik and other places where they could, in fact, implement some—I mean, uh, sign something that would be then implemented for a long time. So I think we're in, uh, in a big trouble in— Many ways, and Putin is in a horrible trouble because of the nuclear of the military promise that didn't materialize, the protests in Moscow, and I would imagine that the two events together that probably would make the KGB, the whatever the F, this uh, security forces, to be even more suppressive, precisely because they want to take away attention from other problems that blow up all over Russia nowadays. And how would you assess the Putin-Trump relationship? It's very hard for people to figure out in this country of Trump showing so much deference to Putin, and also the media coverage. I mean, we're speaking to you after the Mueller report. What your assessment is of the United States media and how it has covered uh, Russia and the, um, the, the investigation into Trump, which really, um, in the Mueller report, you know, he was exonerated in one case of collusion with Russia in interfering with the 2016 election. Um, when it came to obstruction of justice, that's another issue. Well, and, and I think one of the problem, from my point of view, the problem of the media report, not democracy now, uh, being independent, uh, but it's, it, they really made it into the entertainment show. And I think one of the things that feeds Trump, and we know that it feeds Trump, the more coverage he gets, it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the more you get, uh, the more horrible you get. It's almost like in a Survivor show is that, oh, I'm eating cockroaches, look at me. So he does this thing, and it's his, it's his shtick. Uh, and the media really falls for that. I mean, everybody covers it wall-to-wall, -wall blanket. Um, you know, Joe Scarborough yesterday said that when Epstein was, uh, you know, Epstein died, he, it must have been Russia. So this really doesn't help the conversation, because it also gives the Russians or gives Putin the ammunition to say, they're unfair to us. I mean, look at this. We cannot take it seriously, because it's a circus all the way 24-7. So I think that that was really was, instead of understanding and, and even understand the Russian intentions, which would have been much more helpful instead of saying, well, Russia is always it's Boris and Natasha story all over again. We're not going to, you know, even find out what happened—I mean, how it happened and why. Uh, instead, it was all look at the Ruskies. So I think that really did a huge disservice to, to the case. Uh, it, uh, it gave Russians um, this an excuse of being Russian, saying, well, you know, they're not fair to us anyway, so we're going to do whatever it is, because they interfere. And the world all the time. But look, when we try to make sure that our interests are met, that we are criminals. And, you know, they, Putin has a point in this. I think Trump's I mean, I, look, I work on, on dictatorships uh, and dictators, their personalities. I think the interesting thing about Trump is that he likes power. I mean, he's very obvious about these things. I mean, he likes power. And Putin does exude power. He's, you know, completely, you don't see what he thinks. Uh, and George Bush, of course, looked into his eyes and saw his soul. But only George Bush. Nobody else has seen that. Uh, so Trump is attracted to people like that. And for many sort of this dictatorial formulas uh, in, in you, even in Europe, around the world, Putin is a great example. I mean, look at Erdogan in Turkey, look at Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, look at uh, Matteo Salvini in Italy, and, and so on and so forth. So Do Trump, Trump and Philippines. Right, exactly. So tr tr Trump is really not that original, but he's of that type. And so kind of the autocrats of the world unite in some, in some ways. And I think for Putin, when Trump pros promised this great relationship, you know, which Russian president would never agree to have a good relationship with America? Suddenly, Russia is not maligned, which is always does, I mean, whether fairly or not fairly. So, of course, he would pick at him and say, well, Trump loves me, and so I'm going to, you know, try to make this relationship work. But I think instead of understanding the lot of intricacies and relationships so we can have, I'm very grateful for you to have this longish conversation, because usually when I'm another program, it would be two minutes goodbye. So you say Putin is horrible, and that, that we end with that. So I think the fact that the intricacies were lost in this kind of conversation really damaged uh, any possibility to have 
um, understanding, but also at least not on Putin-Trump level, but on even on lower levels to have better conversation than that. I mean, I know the conversations took place, but ultimately, can they be implemented politically? That's a question, because the media created, not without Russian help, mind you, great animosity that it's very difficult to talk about Russia without even sounding, you say Russia, basically, it's a crime right there. Um, finally, where you see all of this headed? I mean, you have been an observer. Um, your own family background is the great-granddaughter of Khrushchev. Um, what do you see happening, possibly? You'll be headed back to Russia. Well, I'd like to say that we'll prevail. Uh, but and what would that look what like? That looks like that there would be some concessions, some conversation with power, uh, some possibility to uh, for these independent candidates to get into Moscow city power. I don't see how it's going to happen, because I don't think there's anybody—I mean, Moscow government, clearly, they are no longer in charge of this situation. So even they are going to get into the, uh, into the Moscow city government, it wouldn't matter anymore, because now it is a federal case, so to speak. So it is a national—it is a national issue. And I don't see Putin the way he has become, the ossified great leader who is sitting there and his view of the world is that the West does it, uh, and they're out to get us uh, and whatnot. How is that going to—how he's going to refrain from that? And there is no political strategist around him who either clever enough to get to him and say, we need to undo this somehow, and the way they don't even see, because I actually think that they stopped over the, stepped over the line. So the only way I see for him, and I hope I'm wrong, is to keep pressing and pressing and pressing and pressing. So all these wonderful things that they did in the last seven years create cities that are comfortable for living. Uh, they are going to stamp on those. They're going to break their own benches. They're going to collapse their own white sidewalks, close the restaurants and whatnot. Because ultimately, when you pr cross that line, the only thing you get to is to 1984, which then again would become very, very dangerous What's for 1984? Putin in power. 1984, George Orwell's, uh, George Orwell's novel, I mean, we keep sort of coming back to this, uh, is that um, they are at that stage. But once you become total oppression, then the total dissidentship, also a very big threat. Uh, so. I would imagine that the last four years, the next four years of Pu five years of Putin's governance is going to be very, very unpleasant and very stressful. And uh, I don't see, and I can be entirely wrong, uh, I don't see people going back into their homes unless they're really incredibly, incredibly scared. But I was with the young people there. Um, I'm older. Nobody—police was not interested in me. But they were really picking all these very young people around me immediately, even if they didn't have any slogans. I actually had slogan, Putin is the thief. But nobody had any slogans, the young people. And they would pick them up anyway, because they want to scare them for the future, for the future generation. A predicament, because Putin has no Crimea to annex anymore, to say, well, look at us, we are all powerful and wonderful. Uh, nobody buys the Western threat, because we know that the West was not really planning those those protests. So I think, I think it's going to be much more of a separation between the public and the Kremlin, which is new, because before the Kremlin, until very recently, it was listening very carefully to what the public wants. But I think we stepped over that, uh, that particular Rubicon. And can I ask you one last question? Russia's relationship with China. Where is that going? And is that significant here? Um, you have President Trump saying, we will have no treaty with Russia without China. Well, I think it is very significant, because uh, we know in, at the beginning of June, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, the president, went to Russia, went to the Bolshoi, because, you know, that's what you do when you come to, uh, come to Russia. He was in St. Petersburg Economic Forum, and they were signing all sorts of things like there is no tomorrow, basically saying, well, we are uh, going to be friends. The interesting thing that when they both spoke, Putin and Xi Jinping, they spoke about absolutely different things. So Xi Jinping was saying, we're still part of, we're part of the world. We want to look into, you know, the world, the global affairs. And Putin was saying, we are going to be China and Russia together. So in some ways, they were talking parallel directions. Um, what I've seen, and I actually, in, in my book, I have the whole chapter on Russia-China relations. And, you know, I traveled across the Amur River to China. I saw uh, 
no love lost between the two countries. I mean, Putin and Xi Jinping may be acting as if they're uh, speaking against the Western, um, Western dominance together, but uh, I think Xi Jinping is using Russia because you know, with, especially with trade wars with China, Russia is um, is a good place for them to um, uh, to uh, trade with. Uh, and for Putin, um, China is this uh, economic giant, or at least you know used to be. We don't know how long it will last. This economic giant that is going to pick up all the Russian slack, but Russia will provide the political stance against the West. Uh, once again, um, it is. I think it's like with Mao Zedong and Stalin, it's a very flawed relationship. They're really not strategic enough and they're not forward looking enough because if the only reason they're together is to stick it to the West, it's just not going to last long because they have more problems between each other ultimately that certainly Russia has uh, or should have with, with the West because essentially it is a Western country that keeps saying, no, no, we are not and we're just going to act exactly against the West because that's the only way we can get noticed and, and feel important about it. Mm -hmm. Nina Khrushcheva, we want to thank you so much for being with us. Professor of International Affairs at the New School, she is the co-author of In Putin's Footsteps, Searching for the Soul of an Empire Across Russia's Eleven Time Zones. She's also the author of The Lost Khrushchev, Journey into the Gulag of the Russian Mind. To see part one of our conversation, go to democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.